Cuba has a prime minister for the first time in four decades. Manuel Marrero becomes head of government of, as the political system is reshaped. And Argentina's Senate puts into its final seal on the new government's emergency law to contain the economic crisis. And why Somali farmers need help as locusts spread across the country. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Carla Gonzalez in Quito and this is From the South. We begin in Cuba. The National Assembly has chosen Manuel Marrero as the country's prime minister. The former minister of tourism takes the post as part of a restructuring of the way Cuba is governed under its new constitution. As established in the Constitution of the Republic, it is my job to propose to this Assembly the nomination of the Prime Minister, who in this case is the comrade Manuel Marrero Cruz. On the second and final day of its session in Havana, the National Assembly elected Cuba's first prime minister in 43 years. The post of prime minister disappeared under the Cuban Constitution of 1976, but it was restored in the new constitution approved in a referendum last February. The Assembly also appointed the ministers to serve under Manuel Marrero in the new cabinet. President Miguel Díaz-Canel will remain in overall charge as head of state. He described the new prime minister's re record in government. Throughout his working and political life, he has been known to be modest, honest, with a great capacity for work, political sensibility and fidelity to the party and the revolution. He has led the tourism sector, one of the main sectors for the development of the Cuban economy. This activity has allowed him to become close to other sectors of the state, as well as the commercial sector and local governments, and to negotiate with international companies and take part in international events. The president closed the special session by detailing the challenges ahead for the island as the U.S. blockade remains in place. We have been going through a year filled with challenges, tensions and aggressions. We face them together, and we are winning by being together. Year number 61 of the revolution has been tough, although never as difficult as it was in the first years, when we had attacks, when we had attacks and invasion, sabotage, fires, vandalism, and when they isolated Cuba across our hemisphere. Inspired by the resistance and strength over six decades, we have gone through 2019 defeating obstacles that seem impossible. And today we have the right to celebrate what we have accomplished, without complacency and conscious that each of our achievements is only a new starting point. President Miguel Díaz-Canel also rejected the coup in Bolivia and the attempt to interfere in several countries in the region, but he said there's hope for a united Latin America. To the foreign attempts to destabilize the Caribbean states of Dominica and Suriname, we respond that Cuba's solidarity with both governments and their people is strong. And in that bitter context, we have seen hope in Mexico and Argentina. None of them have said they will be socialists, but a war has started against their social policies. We ratify our solidarity with the government of Andrés Manuel López Obrador in Mexico and the election in Argentina of President Alberto Fernández and Vice President Cristina Fernández de Kirchner. We insist on the innocence of Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva and the return of his political rights and true freedom. Our correspondent Nayara Tardo was at the assembly and sent this report just before the vote. We are here at the Convention's Palace in Havana, where today is the second and the last day of the fourth session of the National Assembly of Popular Power. Today, the main item on the agenda is the proposal and approval of a new prime minister for Cuba. You will remember that this is a post which is being restored in line with the new constitution as part of a reshaping of the Cuban government. The prime minister will act as the head of government, while President Miguel Díaz-Canel will continue as head of state. The prime minister will serve for five years and will be responsible to both the president and the parliament. So he or she will have to present an account to both of those of the action of the government ministers. 
Those ministers making up the cabinet are also being appointed today by the Cuban parliament. That was a correspondent Nayara Tardo. In other news, Argentina's Senate has voted by a large majority in favor of a key government bill to boost the economy and redistribute wealth. Just as the lower house did on Thursday night, the Senate continued its marathon debate into the early hours of the morning. The final vote was 42 in favor, 23 against, and one abstention. The law on social solidarity and the reactivation of production is the first legislation put to vote by President Alberto Fernández since he took office 11 days ago. This was the first session of the Senate chaired by the new Vice President Cristina Fernández de Kirchner. Let's be clear, this law is based on a principle of solidarity in which those who have most support those who have least. Is it imperfect? Of course it is because you can't do everything at once. Is it the solution to Argentina's problems? Obviously not. This is a law which has one single objective. And here I disagree with my colleague who said Argentina is paralyzed. It isn't paralyzed. Argentina is in free fall. Production and employment are paralyzed, but the country is in free fall. And our first objective has to be to stop this free fall. That is what this law is for. And of course, many other laws will be needed to deal with production, healthcare, education. Bolivia's deposed President Evo Morales says his party, the Movement Towards Socialism, or MAS, will meet on December the 29th to choose its candidate for the upcoming presidential elections. Speaking on a radio station in Argentina where he has been given asylum by the government, Morales said he was calling on members of the MAS to meet next Sunday in Salta on the Argentinian border with Bolivia to make their choice. He said the government of Alberto Fernandez will provide security for the event. On Thursdays, Bolivia's Legislative Assembly sworn in the new members of the Supreme Electoral Court, which has the job of organizing those fresh elections in the next 120 days. The election of the nine members was the result of an agreement between the majority in the assembly, held by the mass party of Evo Morales, and lawmakers supporting the de facto government set up after last month's coup. The speaker of the Senate from the mass said the aim was peace and stability. Already sitting here are the select people in whose hands is a job much more difficult than ours to carry out the election, election that will be fast, swift, and will help pacify our country and to bring back the social peace that we are all looking for. Social and political organizations in Bolivia are condemning the persecution of their leaders, and especially President Evo Morales, by the de facto government. Popular organizations and the movement towards socialism were part of a unity agreement which became the political and social backbone of the government of President Evo Morales. He now has an arrest warrant against him. <laughs> We reject the arrest warrant against our brother Evo, against authorities and social and political leaders. That warrant is an attack on his constitutional rights and those of the Bolivian people on democracy and freedom. There were also allegations that the United States government was behind the coup on November the 10th. We won't allow the interference of the U.S. government under any circumstances. The order to arrest our brother Evo was orchestrated by the U.S. State Department because the coup was also intended to take control of our lithium and other natural resources. The Unity Pact warned that once the Christmas holidays are over, it might organize fresh protests if the persecution of its leaders continues. We are on an emergency footing. The protests are ready, the Bolivian people are ready, and we are waiting for the end of the year because we have to defend the institution of Bolivia's plurinational state. This last week, a group of prosecutors issued an arrest warrant for Evo Morales on charges of sedition and financing terrorism. They asked Interpol to detain him.
We'll take a short break now, but don't go away. Welcome back. More news at this hour. Chile saw new levels of police violence against protesters on Friday evening. Among those attacked by the police was a Telesur crew while going about their professional duties. They had been covering a protest in the Plaza Italia when policemen began to push them and hit them. One policeman tore the gas mask of our cameraman and fired pepper spray into his face at Point Blank Ranch. The lower house of Chile's Congress has approved gender parity, seats for indigenous peoples and the participation of independence. In a bill that seeks to correct the plebiscite already agreed to reform the constitution. However, many protesters say it is still a long way from the kind of constituent assembly demanded on the streets. In Congress, almost everyone is happy, except for the ultra-right wing that didn't want gender parity, nor participation from outside the political parties, for the coming plebiscite on constitutional reform. This is a historical moment of broad unity of the opposition. All of us from the different parties contributed to achieving this. Today marks a new milestone where the political class was able to agree to define and incorporate within the constituent convention the indigenous peoples. A strategy that for the winner of the National History Prize, Gabriel Salazar, is nothing more than a chess move by the political class, who face with the current social movement is uniting so as not to lose power, designing something that looks like a constituent assembly, but isn't. It is a move by the Chilean political class in order to anticipate the constituent process that the people or the citizens themselves might carry out by their own means. That is why it's not called a constituent assembly, but a convention. And it's not just a matter of semantics. The political class, according to Salazar, has moved to get ahead of the people's organization. They set the conditions, the quorum needed to approve the various agreements, and of course they set it as a trap. So if the constituent convention, as they call it, is established according to their plan, they will participate, but the participation of independence is virtually excluded, and therefore the constituent assembly would be controlled and managed by them. The former president of the Association of Journalists and a member of the Communist Party agrees with this analysis. For decades we have been saying that we need a body to discuss the new constitution, but that needs to be a body that is sovereign, with popular parity, which is sovereign in the sense that it is elected specifically for this purpose and defines its own rules on how to draw up the constitution we want. So what then will Chileans vote on next April 26th? As well as deciding whether or not they want a new constitution, they will supposedly decide who will draft it and how, but under rules already set by the peace agreement and the current Congress. With or without gender parity, with or without indigenous peoples, the options will be either a mixed convention or a constituent convention. The first one will be made up 50% of serving members of Congress, while the other half will be made up of elected citizens who are members of political parties. The second option, called a constituent convention, will be made up 100% of citizens elected specifically to write the new constitution. But the candidates will have to stand as part of political slates, and it will operate with the same rules as the current Congress. If they play that game, then what should we do? I think that we should absolutely ignore it, because essentially this proposal is a life raft for them. So then we should establish our own rules of the game with our own power. Let's appropriate the constituent process so that we can decide directly on the constitution and the social, economic and political model that we want. 
It's not easy, this prominent historian admits, because Chileans have never been given real sovereignty. But this is path marked out by the community assemblies, which are already working against the clock. A group of former Venezuelan military officers who took part in the attempted coup in April are now in detention in the United States for violating their immigration status. One of them, Hugo Parra Martinez, is now in a Louisiana prison. He says they were offered amnesty by the right wing if they turned their back on the government of Nicolás Maduro. They recognized the self-proclaimed presidency of Juan Guaidó and fled to the United States. They now say they have been abandoned. In Honduras, at least 18 prisoners died on Friday night after a riot broke out at a prison. Relatives waited for the final list of those killed in the town of Tela as forensic experts took the bodies for autopsies. The authorities said they didn't enter the prison sooner, fearing they could be hurt by gang members who were armed. The latest prison crisis in Honduras began last week when the director of the maximum security prison of El Pozo was shot dead. He was under investigation for witnessing the execution of a former associate of the president's brother, Tony Hernandez, who was convicted for drug trafficking. At least 20 people have been killed and dozens injured in a bus accident in eastern Guatemala. A passenger bus traveling to Santa Elena collided with a truck near the town of Gualan, near Guatemala's Atlantic coast. The cause of the accident was not yet established, as investigations are still going on. The Economic Community of West Africa State's 56th Summit has started in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. The main agenda items for the summit are to discuss the security and economic challenges facing the region. Leaders are also expected to discuss the proposed single currency for the sub-region. Economically, our region is showing positive achievement, despite facing significant challenges, particularly with regard to security. Ecowas economies have demonstrated remarkable resilience. The region economy is growing steadily, reaching 3.3% in 2019. People in Sudan have been celebrating the first anniversary of their protest movement. Thousands gather in Atbara, where the uprisings that toppled President Omar al-Bashir started on the 19th of December last year. Bashir is currently serving a two-year jail sentence for corruption. We are reaffirming our cohesion and unity. The revolution was not possible without the unity of different sectors of the Sudanese people, without the youth and the Kandakas, without the resistance committees and professionals, without honest political parties, and without trade unionists and workers. It would have been impossible for a revolution or any change process to happen in Sudan. Desert locusts have destroyed thousands of hectares of crops in Somalia. The country is facing serious food shortages as a result of the locust invasion, considered to be the worst in 25 years. The locusts have spread to several parts of the country and farmers have pleaded with the government and the international community to help them protect their crops. Some experts say climate change may be to blame for the increase in locusts. Locusts ate grass cover areas and we are fighting to save our farm in which we planted watermelon and beans and we are not able to protect them. We call on the Somali government and the international community to help us. More stories coming up, so stay with us. Thank you for joining us again. Thousands of travelers have been left stranded in France as transport strikes continue into the holiday period. Train stations remain closed in the capital Paris and hundreds of people traveling for Christmas were delayed. The protesters have promised to continue striking over the Christmas holidays after talks with the government failed to break the deadlock. Yes, and uh, because we have another journey in the t on the 28th, I think we're quite worried. We're doing okay today, but we don't know what's going to happen then. So that's, uh, that's quite stressful coming back. 
Hamas has welcomed the International Criminal Court decision to open an investigation into Israel's war crimes. The Hamas spokesman Hassem Qasem said there was overwhelming evidence that Israel had committed war crimes during its occupation of Palestinian land. He called for a quick start to the investigation. We believe that the International Criminal Court should demand the implementation of this decision and should not allow the occupation to impose its conditions and carry out its task in the West Bank, Gaza and Jerusalem. It is time that the occupation is held accountable and punished in all international forums for all the crimes it committed against our Palestinian people. The death toll in India's citizenship protests has reached 24. Nine more people have been killed in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh as protests spread in many parts of the country. Most of the dead are reported to have been killed by gunshots. The Indian government has deployed an anti-terror squad in the streets and internet services have been suspended in protest areas for another 48 hours. And hundreds of women from India's Assam state have joined the protests. The Assam population, which is mainly Muslim, is directly affected by the new law. The women said that they fear the new citizenship law is a threat to their regional identity. The government is taking steps that will result in the disappearance of the Assamese identity. If the Assamese people do not protest or do not try to repel the Citizenship Amendment Act, our Assamese language will vanish from here. One person has been reported dead and another missing as wildfires worsen in Australia. The authorities have issued a travel warning to people intending to visit Australia's affected areas. The country's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, had to cut short his holiday in Hawaii after receiving widespread criticism for leaving the country at a time when the fire crisis is getting worse. Temperatures across Australia are at their highest ever. In 2019, China further opened its financial sector to foreign investment with the elimination of various restrictions. The Chinese government says these policies will continue in the coming year. China is determined to speed up reforms in the finance sector. In the last two years, it has already introduced 34 measures to encourage foreign investment in the stock exchange, insurance and banking sectors. China will make a greater effort to establish a business and financial environment focused on the market in order to have a global competitive advantage. We will reduce even more the list of restrictions on foreign companies, and we will open up even more manufacturing, services and finance sectors. In 2020, China plans to eliminate all limits on the entry of foreign capital into its financial sector, allowing participation in the stock market and investment funds, as well as in insurance and pensions companies. At the same time that we keep monetary policies healthy and stable, we are also taking steady steps to accomplish all the measures of opening up to foreign investment. We will expand convertibility in capital markets, improve the free use of the renminbi, and aim to ensure a greater and higher quality opening in the financial sector. Among the most important measures are the first ever connection between some Chinese stock markets with those abroad and the entrance of foreigners to the Chinese stock market, the second largest in the world, with $33 billion in assets. As I understand it, the Chinese economy is in a process of transformation and the participation of foreign companies is a step forward compared to before. The economy in China is better, both China and everyone else benefit. Experts consider these policies as a master move by President Xi Jinping to consolidate the image of a solid country, capable of including others in its alternative proposal for development, just when the world is facing a protectionist offensive by the United States. Irán Siperasa, Telesur, Beijing, China. And with that, we end our news brief. But you can find all of our stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. And be sure to also join us on social media. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.